this is my body that is given for you. Likewise, after the meal, he took the cup. And once again, he gave thanks to God the Father, telling his disciples this time to take and drink. And drink all of this. For this is my blood, he said.
Jason here today. Jason is a part of a group. He's a part of actually many groups. He's been a pastor. He's been many different things and, and still today doing so much ministry. But he's a part of a group called the Gideons. And the Gideons is a group that we sponsor. And I'm going to invite him up to talk a little bit about the Gideons and share a little bit of the gospel of Jesus Christ with us. So make Jason welcome if you will. Thanks, Tony, and, and thank you all for opening the doors and, uh, and allowing me to be here this morning. It's it's a it's a blessing any time to get the opportunity. You get so humbled uh, because I'm I'm really not able to do this. And, and some of you know I ran into Michael Boyles. You know, back uh, we we graduated together, and I hadn't seen him in a, in a long time. And back when we were in school, Michael, I wasn't going to be doing this. You know, and so it's really neat to to see what God will do do for you and in you and through you. But uh, again, as, as uh, Brother Tony said, I am a Gideon. Uh, most of you are familiar with the Gideons, so I'll, I'll only share a little bit of that. Uh, the Gideons International have been around for 120 years. Their mission is to put Bibles into, within reach of everyone on the planet. Most are familiar with uh, the Bibles in the hotel, right? You go to a hotel, of course, if you're a Gideon, that's the first place you go. Okay, make sure that there's a Bible in there. And, uh, and we're to report it if there's not and try to, try to make sure that one is uh, placed. You'll see them in the hospitals. You'll see them being handed out. Uh, I got this one uh, in 1983. Still have it. And so I got handed that one, I believe, in the fifth grade. So you can do the math and figure out how old I am. <laughs> the 
Gideon's uh, place Bibles in uh, dentist office, doctor's offices, uh, villages in Africa, Southeast Asia, over 190 countries. Gideon's have printed and distributed over 2 billion Bibles, copies of God's Word since the beginning in 1908. It was pretty neat to me. One of their very first meetings uh, took place in Louisville, Kentucky. I hadn't realized that until uh, I had read a testimony. Many of you have heard testimony after testimony. This isn't the first time the Gideons have been here, and, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, of the testimonies of how God used a Gideon or a Gideon's Bible to share his love, and to share the hope that is in Jesus that we've sung about and already talked about this morning. Many souls have been saved, not by the Gideon's Bible, but by Jesus Christ in whom that Bible points us to, talks about, and leads us to. This very Savior who we've come here to worship today. This Jesus whom we want to get to know, to walk with, and to Im imitate. I don't personally recall one person who has come to accept Jesus, to know Jesus, or who tries to walk with Jesus and imitate Jesus, who has done so apart from God's Word. Sure, some of us came to be saved through someone preaching. They were preaching God's Word. Some have been saved through another person witnessing to them. That witness brought through and delivered from God's Word. Some were saved through various hardships or circumstances that led them back to what they had heard from years prior. God's Word. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy, Chapter 3, verse 16, and he was continually pouring into Timothy. If you remember who Timothy was, he was a young protege. He was a very young, maybe as young as 17 years old when he first met Paul. But Paul, much older, was continuing pouring into him that God's word is breathed out by God and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God might be complete, equipped for every good work. Paul wrote this during his last imprisonment in Rome. And he knew that he would not likely be re released that time around. One could sense that he was really trying to get through uh, his last bit of wisdom and encouragement to Timothy. It's no coincidence that Paul gave him this word about God's word. And this is where I want to plead with you today. You know, I don't know if you can know the difference in these Bibles here. This one from 1983. You know, that's neat and cool and all that. I'm kind of glad I still have it all these years later. But it's still here. It should be around out by now. I was born again and saved uh, around 19, uh, 2002. And a Gideon gave me a Bible and I carried it with me every day. That's what it ought to look like, right? And then another one after this one, I got... I was afraid it was going to fall apart. I carried this one until the smartphones come along. <laughs> now we don't need to carry them as much, do we? I, I will speak to that one moment. Uh, uh, smartphones, and I get it. Uh, it is convenient. It's easy. But let me encourage you to open God's Word. There's something about it that, that's far and away more. Uh, and, and you're less, obviously less op opportunity to get distracted with a text coming in or a message or what have you. Uh, open God's Word. And, and that's what I want to plead to you today. See, I'm here to give a Gideon's presentation and, and, and you've been kind enough to allow me to take up an offering after church or, or what have you. And, and that's good. Uh, the thing that appealed me to the Gideons was that uh, 97, 90 cents per dollar goes to distributing God's Word. Meaning that if I go to a meeting where the Gideons, I pay my way. If I go to, a lot of you know Morris Hypes, right? Morris Hypes goes to a convention. He pays for his gas to get there. He pays for his hotel. He pays for all of his food. The Gideons fund themselves. And through your donations, then that goes to printing and sending these Bibles out all over. That was really appealing to me at that high rate. My plea to you today. My second plea. The first plea is to help the Gideons. My first plea today is that I found these surveys 
Only 19% of churchgoers are, are reading their Bible every day. That's one in five, roughly. 27% read it a few times a week. 14% once a week. 22% once to a few times a month. 18% of regular churchgoers, almost again, one in five, rarely or never read the Bible. Now, on the flip side of that, 90% of us believe that the Bible is, as Paul said, God's inspired word. And we want to live by its principles. Yet 54%, if you add up some of those numbers, 54% are reading it less than a week, once a week on average. Now, at the risk, Tony, of coming here and sounding like I'm trying to chastise or complain, I'll stop there. I've not come to do that. I've come to encourage you. I invite you to start now or to pick up the pace now. If you're one of those who rarely cracks it open, open it up once a week. Start there. Start with one verse. If you're a couple of times a week, then improve. Maybe make it every day. If you're an everydayer, there's always more. Join a group if you're not in a group. I don't want to leave out you every day or what's next for you. There is no end. It's always so neat for me. Uh, my dad, I don't know how many times he's read the Bible through, has, has, uh, he'll call me sometimes and say, hey, I was reading this scripture and I finally figured it out. That'll be 80 here in a few weeks. And so it's really neat to me to know that it's living. It's a living Bible. Hebrews says it's sharper than two, any two-edged sword. It's piercing than even the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. God's word is living and powerful. That's why at 80 and after several times, Dad's able to say, wow. I want to use another illustration because sometimes we get too tied up in age. I, I thought that was nice up here, your communion stewards. You had all ages. It's really God's family. We're all God's children. 1 John 3 says that we are all God's children. We really are His children. I got my little redhead. You saw him bouncing around here this morning. He's fine. I'll use this as an illustration. See, we don't want to think about age here, but I'm going to use the differences of experience. Judas 5. It's kind of hard to count to 30, isn't it, bud? Sometimes we skip over uh, 17, 18, 19. We just kind of run and then get to 20. And then he goes, okay, it's pretty good. And the other guy there, quite a bit bigger, he's 12, and he's already into algebra and geometry. Continuing on, progressing on. More experience. My sister, 55. She's not here, so I can tell her age. <laughs> okay? 55. She has uh, multiple degrees in mathematics. She's a, she even is certified to teach at the collegiate level. Now, Connie will tell you, my sister will tell you, that those things that the middle schoolers, my son is learning, algebra, it's all basis points to much bigger things. She, at one time, struggled to count to 30, like the little one. But she had to start somewhere, right? She had to start somewhere and then continue on and carry on and, and growing and learning and growing. She had to seek out help. She had to get teachers and other mentors and tutors. She had to have a persistence about her. She had not to give up when she didn't understand it. She'll tell you that there is more yet after all those degrees and all that time that there's an infinite amount. We learn about infinite oftentimes through mathematics, don't we? It takes desire, it takes teachers, it takes time, it takes perseverance. Don't give up. It takes acceptance, acceptance that, that there are going to be others that pick it up faster than you. 
I would like to encourage you, uh, 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 thankfully, here your life groups. You have life groups here. You have other opportunities. If you're not in a life group, give it a go. If that's your first step, if you're nervous, if you're, well, my hair is gray and white, and it's going to be a little bit embarrassing that some of these others know more than me. Let that go. In God's eyes, we're all His children, right? My parents don't look at my sister, 55 years old, really all that much different than I look at my own five-year-old. Yeah. Anybody relate to that? They're still our children. God, all the more. So join in. And, and, and those of you who are more experienced, be gentle. Be patient. Have courage. I understand, Tony, that you're talking on parables. You are. And, and, and what a great way to start. Uh, and marrying these two themes together, that you would be able to get into uh, reading the Bible. Uh, start with these parables. There are about 40 of them that Jesus taught. Jesus taught parables so that, that he uh, would, would be able to use analogies and stories to get his, those who were believing in him to understand more. And, and maybe some, some school of thought says that, that the unbelievers, that they would just keep on unbelieving and move on. There are some that aren't going to believe. But he uses parables, and I wanted to uh, share with you this morning uh, one of my favorite parables. Before we do, uh, would you pray with me? Make the book live to us, O oh Lord. Show us yourself. <coughs> Show us ourselves and show us Christ and make the book live to us for Jesus' sake. Amen. I can't remember who wrote that quote that's in a psalm from way back when. I, I just thought that was beautiful. Uh, and it helps me whenever I'm getting ready to study to pray that, pray that prayer. I'm going to start with uh, the parable of the laborers. One of my favorites. For the kingdom of heaven, this is Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. When he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, denarius is about a day's wage, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour, about 9 a.m., and saw others standing in the marketplace. And to those he said, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I'll give you. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour, noon, and again at the third hour, which is about 3 p.m. And he did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour, about 5 p.m., these folks, their normal day was 6 to 6. About 5 p.m., he found others standing around, and he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day long? They said to him, because no one hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. When the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. When those hired about the eleventh hour came, each one received a denarius. When those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more but each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, The last men have worked only one hour. You've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the scorching heat of the day. But he answered and said to one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go, but I wish... To give this to the last man, this last man the same as you. Is it not lawful, lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? So the last shall be first, and the first last. <coughs> the neat thing, one of the many neat things that I have found is that 
so much of this Bible doesn't fit into our way of thinking in the world. Notice that. It's upside down. Many times you'll read through here, it's upside down from what we've been taught with what society tells us. There's no way that that's right. Right? How many of you, including myself, would be okay with showing up at 6 a.m. knowing that I was going to get the same pay as the fellow who showed up at 5 p.m. If we're honest with ourselves, we'd be grumbling too. What about the guy that showed up at 5 and got the same pay the whole day's wage? What if that was us? How would we feel? Wow, I can get used to this. An hour a day? Sign me up. The message in here is, is clearly this, this landowner is like the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is heaven, but it's also God's children, the kingdom, the church. Some of you started at 6 a.m. You've been walking with Jesus for many years. Some of you showed up at 5. Some of you everywhere in between. I'd like for you for a moment, those of you who showed up at 6, those of you who showed up maybe at, at, at 9 or noon, maybe even 3, I would like for some of you to think about what Paul said. <coughs> Philippians chapter 3. He said, forgetting what is behind, I press on. Forgetting what is behind. Now, don't forget what you've learned. Don't, don't forget all the fond memories. Don't forget what Jesus did with you. I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting forget, forgetting that you are more experienced. Ask God to make it new to you again. A fresh start in His Word. Those of you who are late, do not get discouraged. That's the neat thing about the inheritance of being a, ch a child. Which of you, see that see the, again, we go to the, again, some of you who showed up at six, you get the same, the same Jesus, the same heaven, the same Father. Those of you who showed up at five, it's all level ground. That's why I love the communion this morning. It fit right in with me. Some of those folks have been following him for 40 years. Some for maybe 60 or 70 years. Some, maybe 20 years. Lastly, I would like to challenge you. There, there is more. I, but I would also like to challenge you because maybe, maybe some of you out there, maybe you haven't started yet. See, they, they gathered oftentimes in the village, in the marketplace. This was a, this was a normal sight. Jesus, Jesus was... Comparing something that they would know be familiar with. They would oftentimes go to the marketplace and the farmers would come to town and they would hire them just like just like he said. And I'm I'm going to uh, make an assumption that some days some guys went home empty handed. They didn't get hired that day. And they have a choice to get discouraged. But keep coming. Some of you have not accepted the position yet. This, is, this Bible is for all. Some of you who have not accepted, some of you who have been in here for 60 years or more, it's for all. That would be my challenge for you. As, as Tony continues on through these parables of, of looking what, what God has for you in each and every one of them. It's 2,000 years ago he was preaching these and teaching this way, and it's good for us today. There are other ways that you can support the Gideons. You can pray for them. I, I uh, as, as you attested, uh, praying this morning, God hears the answers. Sometimes that's healing, and sometimes it's different. But he always hears, and so if you would pray for the Gideons, that would be the first and foremost thing that I would ask you to do. If you could also pray for your own self, that you would uh, 
get into your word. That you would share this word with others. That you would ask him to give you the courage to join a group. A group can be too. Share together his word. Pray for the Gideons. Uh, they have a, a website, Gideon.org. You can go there and find out more, find out other ways to give and how you can support or, or become a Gideon. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for you and, and what you've given us. Lord, we, we don't really, we're not unable to see it all. But we're thankful for what we are able to see and what you've given to us. Lord, help us to see more. Help us to want more of you. Help us to get a, develop a hunger for your word. And then that we would be able to have the courage through your Holy Spirit to go out and spread that word. Lord, we profess we're sinners. We confess we're sinners. We're sorry for what we've done. We're sorry for not being what you wanted us to be. But we're again also so thankful that you gave us Jesus that we would be accepted into your family. Lord, be with us now as we carry on about the rest of the day, the week. Be with the Gideons who are out in harm's way. Lord, we have it so easy here. Others are under heavy persecution. We pray for protection for them. Lord, and that you would do your work in their, in their lives and in those that they're trying to reach. Lord, I pray a blessing over this church and all of those churches out there who tell your truth, who proclaim Jesus this morning, that we would all get into our word, get into your word, and walk with Jesus. It's in his name. and preaching the word this morning and I wanted to kind of give a little bit of a testimony of myself to the Gideons. I, like many of you, probably thought of the Gideons like I thought of many other charitable organizations or, or, or groups like that and, and you know, you, you, you see that and so many people, they ask for money and you think, well, you know, I don't know if I want to give any money to this or not. Where does it really go? What's it really go for? But but I'll, I'll tell you where the, the difference come with the Gideons with me and this is a strange story for a pastor to be telling, so stick with me. I promise it's, it's not it's it's going somewhere. But I'd been a pastor at a conference uh, several years back. As I'd become a pastor, we'd start going to different conferences for pastors and leadership conferences and things like that. And I, I met a pastor, and, and I mean, this guy when he got up to speak, he was incredible. I mean, maybe one of the best speakers I had ever met in my life. And, you know, the church that he started, he started out with 15 people, and they were running 5,000. You know, it just grew like wildfire, and I thought, man, this guy is just filled with the Word of God. He is just, you know, he is so passionate about what he's doing. And I said, you know, what made the difference in your life? What, what, what you know, because as a pastor, you want to know these things, because, you know, if you can capitalize that, you want to capitalize on that. And the guy says, he says, you know, he says, it was back when I was in college. And he said, these crazy guys were coming around. These were Gideons. He said, these crazy guys were coming around handing out Bibles. And he said, you know, I didn't want a Bible. I was going to take that thing and throw it in the trash can. But my buddy grabbed me and he said, dude, you've got to grab one of those Bibles. They make the best rolling papers in the world. Oh. <laughs> I swear, this is, I can't make this up. That's what he said. And he thought, well, you know, okay, fine. I'm not a Christian. I'm going to take one. So we take one with the intention of tearing the pages out and using them for rolling papers. But he takes it back, and as my buddy here said, the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. He opens it up, and lo and behold, he opens it up to Ephesians. And he reads one verse, that it is not by your works, that it is by the grace of God that you are saved. And as he read this, he came under all this conviction. He said, and in that moment, he said, I, I started to read, and he said, I couldn't read it down, or put it down. He said, I went back, I read all of Ephesians. 
He said, I read all of Galatians. He said, and then I went into 1st and 2nd Corinthians and I was really lost. And he said, he said, and as I began to read, I began to think, I began to, I began to wonder. And he said, and, and I couldn't help myself. And he went to a group and it was called, called Youth in Christ at that time. And they were in the colleges and he took this Gideon Bible to him and he said, I need to know more about God. And the guy introduced him to Jesus. And it started there. It started with a Gideon Bible. Now, to me, there is no greater thing we can do than to take the Word of God to people that don't know the Word of God. Because we can stand up here and we can preach. We can, we can say all the things that we want to say. And we can do it in an elaborate way. And, and maybe, maybe, you know, develop a sermon out and unpack it in such a way that... You know, it, it, it's it got funny moments. It's got some good moments in it. But there is nothing that will convict your heart more than the Word of God. It's Jesus' words to us. And if you want to know what God is like, you need to look no farther than Jesus. And I would tell you today that, that this is probably the most noble and most honorable cause I have ever seen in my life. So I'm going to quit talking now. And I'm going to invite our musicians to come up. But we want to give you an opportunity as our church supports the Gideons. We want to give you that opportunity to support the Gideons also. I'm going to invite my friend Jason to, to meet me in the back of the church as we close today. And I want to give you that opportunity. If you would like to donate some money, to donate anything to the, to the Gideons, we're going to have a basket back there. But more than anything else, like Jason, I want to invite you to pray for the Gideons throughout this next week. Just make that a priority in your prayer. Because what they're doing they're taking the Word of God to people who have never heard the Word of God before. So, let's close. And I want to give you that invitation also this morning. If you've never invited Jesus into your heart, then make this morning this morning that your life changes. You come forward this morning. Allow us to pray and celebrate that moment with you as we stand and we sing.